All right, today we're going to talk about electron configurations, and to do that, we're going to specifically describe the locations of the electrons. This will be the most specific we get with our description of electrons in this class. At the end of today, you should know how to write, a, write in an electron configuration, draw a dot diagram, and also draw an orbital diagram. So the first thing is to set up your periodic table. So on your periodic table, you need to add some information. You should already have these numbers along the rows on the left hand side, but now I need you to add an S above rows columns one and two, and then label it one and two. I need you to add a P above columns three through eight. Notice that helium moved over next to hydrogen. I need you to add a D above columns one through 10 in the transition metals. And then lastly, F uh, above the lanthanide and actinide series. So these are referring different blocks on the periodic table. Pause the movie here, pause the video here if you need to. So we talked about sublevels in a previous lesson and those sublevels are um, different ways to describe the different energy levels. So in, in energy levels we have different blocks including the S, P, D, and F block. Now these different sublevels can hold a certain number of electrons. S can hold 2, P can hold 6, D can hold 10, and F can hold 14. Now, the reason that happens is because there's a specific number of orbitals in each of those sublevels. There's one in the S, and since each orbital can hold two electrons, that equals uh, one orbital equals the two electrons that we see. Since P can hold a total of six electrons, six divided by two equals three total orbitals. Ten electrons divided by two equals five orbitals, and then 14 electrons divided by two equals seven orbitals. When we do an electron configuration, there's a couple rules we need to follow. The first one that's going to be most important to us is called the Aufbau Principle. Now, the Aufbau Principle says that you cannot put an electron in a higher energy level if there's a lower energy level available. That would be the ground state energy level of a given electron. This sounds kind of complicated, and this diagram makes it look a little bit more complicated than what it is. You're just going to read your periodic table from the left to right, top to bottom, like you read a book. What this diagram is showing that the 1s orbital happens to be the lowest energy level, then the 2s, followed by 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, etc., etc. If we're going to do the electron configuration for silicon, I need to look at my periodic table. And I'm going to start by finding silicon over here. This is where I need to stop counting squares. I'm going to start counting squares, though, at the hydrogen square. And I'm going to read the number to the left, 1. Then I'm going to read the letter above, S. And then I'm going to read the number above each column. So 1S1, 1S2 would be the representation of these two blocks. If I go through a whole block, the S block, I'm only going to write the last square in that block. So 1S2 is going to be what I start by writing down. I'm going to follow my pen all the way across to the right, and there's nothing else over here because we already used helium in our um, count because that's over next to hydrogen. So I'm going to come back into the left. I'm going to read the number on the left-hand side, 2, S, and then this is 1 and 2. I only need to write down the second one. But from beryllium, I'm going to go right straight across <clears throat> and run into boron. To the left of boron is the number 2, the letter is now P, I'm going to count the squares, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I'm going to write down 2P6. I cannot go further right, so I come back into the left, just like you're reading a book. The number is 3, S, 1 and 2. I can go further right yet. I get into aluminum, and now I have 3P, but I need to stop at silicon, so 3P1, 3P2. So that's the electron configuration for silicon. You can also do one for selenium. Now selenium is way over here, so it's much further down. So I'm going to start again at hydrogen, 1, S, 1, and 2. Two, S, one and two. We're in beryllium square. I can go further right. Two, P, six. Stopping at neon square, back into the left. 
We're now in sodium square, 3s1 and 2, so that's magnesium. From magnesium, I can go further right, go straight across, 3p6 gives me argon. An argon square, I can't go any further right, so back into the left. 4s1 and 2. If I go further right to calcium, I'm bumping into scandium, and scandium says 3, so I have to say 3 again. 3d, 1 through 10. That's zinc square, and then finally, to get to selenium, 4p1234, 4p4. So you can see that we have uh, this electron configuration that we're looking at, and um, what we have on our electron configuration is this one, and then we also have an additional example of titanium. What I didn't do uh, up to this point was underline my valence electrons. We can do that here in a second, and I didn't really talk about what all these things are. So the numbers, the big numbers in front of letters are energy levels. The letter is the sublevel. It's also going to describe the shape of the orbitals. And then the superscripts are the number of electrons in each of those. So if I count this up, there's 2 plus 2, which makes 4, plus 6 more makes 10, plus 2 and 2 more makes 14. So there's 14 electrons in silicon, and that makes sense because silicon's atomic number is 14. We could do the same thing for titanium. Now, valence is going to be the highest energy level. So my energy levels are the numbers in front of letters. 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. So 3 and 3, these are my valence um, energy levels, and I'm going to normally circle that, circle your valence. For selenium, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 3, 4. So my 4s are my highest number. Notice how we're going to skip 3 because it's a smaller number than 4. If I want to count valence electrons, there's 2 plus 2 for a total of 4 valence electrons here. And then likewise for selenium, there's 2 plus 4 for a total of 6 valence electrons. Now, on the selenium example, we started to get to a really long electron configuration, and there's a shortcut on that, and that's the noble gas shortcut. And you're going to do that by finding the atom that you're interested in, go up a row all the way to the right to the noble gases, write that symbol in square brackets, and then you're going to start your electron configuration from there. So examples of that would look for the two that we did. For silicon, find my atom, go up a row all the way to the right, I found my noble gas, it's neon. So I'm going to start out with square brackets, neon, and now I can't go any further right, so back into the left, it's going to be sodium square, 3s12, over to the right, 3p12. So 3s2, 3p2. And you'll notice that it finishes up the same way that my original electron configuration did, and it shows me the same number of valence electrons. For selenium, find my atom, go up a row, all the way to the right, argon, can't go any further right if I'm in argon square, so I'm going to go back into the left, I'm now in 4, potassium, so 4s12, 3d1 through 10, 4p1234, so that was 4s2, 3d10, 4p4, we can still see our valence electrons and they're still ending up the same way as the original configuration. If you happen to be looking at an atom like, let's say, manganese, there's not a row above that, but you're going to pretend that there is that space that would represent a row. Go up a row all the way to the end, and for man manganese, you would choose, for example, argon. So that's how to write a noble gas shorthand, which is almost always acceptable unless the problem specifically says write a full electron configuration. Now we can also show these valence electrons in something called a dot diagram. And they're only going to show the valence electrons, the highest energy level electrons, which is going to only be the S and P uh, sublevels. Dot diagrams also require us to do something called Hund's rule. And Hund's rule basically says that electrons are going to fill a single orbital. So that's why we talked about orbitals at the beginning of this talk. Um, they're only going to fill a single orbital with one electron if there's other same energy level orbitals available. Um, one way to think of this is just being polite, or if you're at a potluck, make sure that you only have a first helping before everyone else gets a second helping. So 
uh, distribute your electrons. And what that's going to look like is something like this. You're going to write down the element symbol, so silicon, and you saw that S electrons go on the right. Now, since S electrons are lower energy than P, I can put two electrons in the S orbital first, so two dots. Then P is located on the top, left, and the bottom. And since there's two electrons, I can't double up right now. I need to first give each side of silicon one dot prior to giving any side of silicon multiple dots. Likewise, on selenium, write down selenium symbol, 4s2, so 2s dots, and it's okay to give s both dots prior to doing the p. Then there's four p dots, so I'm going to spread those out. One, two, three, each gets, side gets one, and then it doesn't matter which side you double up. So I could double up on the bottom, or I could double up on the top, or double up on the, on the left. Notice that there's only two dots per side. That's a dot die. The last step is to draw an orbital diagram. Um, orbital diagrams for our class are only going to show post-noble gas electrons. You could do a full-blown orbital diagram for all the electrons, but that's just a lot of really kind of pointless work. When we draw an orbital diagram, we need to worry about Pauli's exclusion principle. Now, the technical, def def technical definition says electrons can't have the same quantum numbers, um, which means basically that each electron is unique, and because of that, the electrons in an orbital spin in the opposite direction. That's what we know about these electrons. So up spin versus down spin. When we draw these orbital diagrams, we're going to represent orbitals as horizontal lines. So for s, because there's only one s orbital, in other words, there's two columns in the s block, two divided by two, because that's the capacity of one orbital, is one. p, there's six columns, so uh, six divided by three gives, excuse me, six divided by two gives you three. D, there's 10, divided by 2 gives you 5, and F, 14 divided by 2, this should say 7, this is a mistake. So this should say 7 instead of 14. Hund's rule still applies for these. So if we're going to draw orbital diagrams, post-noble gas, so here's my 3s2. S can hold two electrons, so I draw one line, I label it with 3s. P can hold a total of six electrons, so I need to draw three lines, because 6 divided by 3, 2 equals 3. Now I'm going to look at my electrons. 3s2, there's two electrons. Electrons are represented as arrows. So there's an up arrow followed by a down arrow. For the 3p, there's two electrons. Now Hund's rule says be polite. Give each line one. And notice that there's going to be one empty orbital. There's two half-filled orbitals, and that's okay. So these two half-orbitals, half-filled orbitals, are represented by these two dots. You can see the 3s is represented by this. This up arrow, down arrow is the Pauli exclusion principle that we were talking about. For selenium, since we're draw, drawing post-noble gas, I need to draw one line for 4s. 3d is going to have five lines. 10 divided by 2 is 5. And p will have three lines because 6 divided by 2 equals 3. 4s, 2. Here's my up arrow down arrow, Pauli exclusion principle, 3d10. Each orbital gets one before any of them are doubled up. And notice we're using half arrows, it's a little faster. 4p4, up, 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 there's three. My fourth one, by convention, is always going to be the first orbital. So after watching this video, you should have learned how to write an electron configuration, a dot diagram, and a orbital diagram. I hope that helps.